Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and this is Great Big History Podcast. And in this episode, we do a kind of redo. You may have seen, uh, we had three episodes on the Great Depression and the death of capitalism. Uh, we're going to try to do this again, but in one episode. So instead of three episodes of medium length that end up being very long, we're going to try to do it in one kind of one class episode. So this is the death of capitalism, the Great Depression, redo, redux, part one, capitalism, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay, so when we talk about capitalism, or what you'll hear in economics called liberalism, is laissez-faire capitalism. See, economics is weird in that liberalism was trying to get government out of the economy because it used to be the king ran the economy. And so liberals back in the 15, 16, 1700s, Adam Smith, for example, wanted government out. They wanted to change the system from the government regulating the economy to the government out. So they were called liberals. So thus liberalism in economics. So you will hear today people talk about neoliberalism. And neoliberalism is just kind of going back to laissez-faire capitalism. That government is not in the economy. And that comes out of the 1960s, 1970s, and, and basically the neoliberalism, neoliberalists want less government in everything else, in everything else but economics, in politics, in social, in society, in social services, in education, liberal means more government. It means Keynesian economics. It means social welfare. It means um, more regulation. So economics is weird, and you'll see people argue uh, about it on Twitter and Reddit when they don't really understand that economics, because it goes back to the 1776 with Adam Smith, has a different definition of things. So we mean laissez-faire capitalism, Adam Smith capitalism. So when we say capitalism, we mean the idea of an economic system where private individuals own property and the means of production in order to make a profit. And this is what is different from mercantilism or the traditional kind of uh, nobility of the 1500s or the Roman Empire. The purpose of making that profit is to reinvest that profit into growing the operation. That's the new part. That was different in the 1700s and 1800s because the idea was you made a profit and then you bought land with it and you became landed gentry. You became a lord. You didn't grow a corporation. You didn't grow a business. The whole point of the business was that you made enough money that you could buy land. Capitalism changes that. You own the property. You own the means of production. So you own the factory and the machines in the factory. And then you have your business in order to make profits and then reinvest those profits into growing the operation. You do not have capitalism without that reinvestment. Okay, so that's capitalism. So what about laissez-faire, which is French for leave alone? It's the idea that government should not regulate nor interfere with a profit-oriented business beyond the regulations to assure the workings of a market. Very, very minimum government. Laissez-faire, to leave alone. Now, the idea of government intervention was... Get government out of the business because in the 1500s, government ran the economy. It gave monopolies. It created corporations. William Penn created Pennsylvania as a kind of business given to him by the king. 
The king said, you can own this land and you can run it. He had a charter. Nobody else could own or work in or control Pennsylvania except William Penn. The idea of laissez-faire capitalism is to get people, to get government out of that. So that corporations, individuals, make the economic decisions. Now, there's always going to be a little need of government in order to make sure no one's cheating, to make sure no one has a monopoly that wipes out other competition, to make sure that the market continues to work. Okay? So it's complicated, but that's the basic idea of capitalism in the United States pre Great Depression, pre-1932. Okay. So what does capitalism care about? It cares about capital, money. Money is privileged and protected. People are not. We literally just saw it happen with the with a bank run on Silicon Valley Bank, on uh, First Republic Bank, on Credit Suisse, that just happened, Credit Suisse, capital is protected. Money is protected. People, you lose your job, you lose your house, you lose your health care. Who cares? F off. Capitalism doesn't care. Capitalism cares about money. That's 2008, 2009. The great, quote, recession. It was all about saving the banks, saving the capital, saving the money. All the people who got wiped out and lost their houses, F them. Nobody cared. Nobody bailed them out. Nobody bought somebody else's house and let them stay in it. The government didn't help people. The government helped money, investors, banks. That's what capitalism cares about, money. So people, money can move across borders. Instantaneously, people cannot. People have to go through customs. They have to go through visas. They, have, they can't immigrate. Money, I can have my money in a German bank today, a French bank tomorrow, a Japanese bank by Friday. Money can move all over. People cannot. What does capitalism not care about? Well, pretty much everything else. Life and ethics and morality and equality. All of those things are just a means to an end. The purpose is profit and reinvestment and growth. Becoming bigger. Becoming bigger. Google, when Google first started, they had a, an anthem. They had a theme called, don't be evil. That's not Google anymore. Now it's make effing money. Make a lot of money. So capitalism doesn't care. Does it have to wipe out the whales to make money? It will. Does it have to pollute uh, Love Canal, New York? It will. Does it have to kill workers by accident or kind of on purpose? Kill customers like the um, Ford Pinto, which blew, was a car that literally blew up because it didn't have a $5 protection shield on its um, gasoline a tank. If you want a version of that, see Fight Club, where um, Edward Norton's character is on the uh, on a plane and he's talking to his, the person sitting next to him, as people do, and she goes, "Oh, what do you do?" And he goes, "Oh, I go around and look at accidents for car companies, and I decide what happened, and if something happened that is because of the car, because of manufacturing." I figure out how many times that's going to happen. And if the cost of fixing that problem is less or is more than the cost of paying people off for getting hurt or killed, then we don't fix it. We just pay the people later. And the woman is like horrified at this. But that's capitalism. Capitalism doesn't care about your morality. It doesn't care about your life. It doesn't care about you. 
It will grind you up and spit you out as long as it makes money, profit, and growth. So why do people like capitalism? If, if, if you go, oh, wait, professor, you're not being very nice to capitalism. Well, that's just the definition of capitalism, man. I'm sorry if you think it's harsh, but it is harsh. So why do people like it? Because it is harsh. Or the great purveyor of capitalism is Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec. Capitalism, God's way of determining who is smart and who is poor. Capitalism is the only way it makes America great, England okay, and France, which is the most socialist of the three countries, terrible. The free market is a jungle. It's beautiful and brutal and laissez-faire should be left alone. Why do people like capitalism? Because it allows more people to own more stuff and accumulate their wealth faster. No other system of economics has allowed more people to accumulate wealth. None. And accumulate it faster. Wealth used to take generations, multi-generations to accumulate. Now you could do it with capitalism in your own generation. Now, we overestimate in our stories rich, uh, poor to rich, you know, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. It really doesn't happen. And even if you read your Dickens or your Horatio Alger um, stories of like, here's the poor kid who gets rich through hard work, it's always hard work that gets him noticed by a rich guy, a rich benefactor, who then sends him to college, invests in his company, um, if you read Thomas Piketty's book, Capital, he tells you flat out, most wealth since 1700 is inherited. It's not created. Rich people are rich because their grandfather was rich. Their great-grandfather was rich. But capitalism does allow that few percentage points to go from poor to rich but it does also allow a much larger percentage of people to go from kind of poor to well off to comfortable it creates the middle class that we don't have in the ancient world in my 101 class really and we don't have in the middle ages really we have rich and we have poor. Now, I will tell you, poor people, rich, middle class people are still poor in terms of this class. And I've, I've had arguments with students and they go, I am not poor. I am middle class. And I go, yes, that's true. Except by being middle class, you're still poor. And what do we mean by that? What we mean is a definition of wealth. Wealthy, rich, are the top 1%, 2% of any society. And those people will never be poor. They will never run out of money. They don't talk about money. They don't think about money because it's like water. It always exists. It's the people on succession or billions or industry or, or even friends or Seinfeld, they never debate about paying the rent on their apartments. They never have problems with losing their job. Oh, that's not a problem. I'm going to get something better. Poor is that you will run out of money sooner or later. And so the middle class just runs out of money later than, quote, the poor. But if I lost my job, and this is how you know you're poor, can you figure out how many months of paying your bills you can have until you have zero money in the bank? If you lose your job, 
how can you calculate when you'll have zero money? That means on the scale of rich to poor, you're poor. Now we call ourselves middle class and I might get six months or nine months or even a year. But the mortgage, the rent, the bills, the electricity, the food, and you could cut back and you can maybe go a little farther, but sooner or later you will run out of money. Rich folk or wealthy folk, if you want wealth instead of rich, wealthy folk will never run out of money. In fact, they don't work. That's what a gentleman is in England or in France. They, by definition, don't work. Read your Jane Austen. None of these people work. None of these men work for a living. They, none of them pull a salary for their labor. They live off their investments. So capitalism allows more people to own stuff and accumulate their wealth faster. Capitalism also allows for more diversity, more entry. Capitalism doesn't care about your racism. More people can make money. Your capitalism. That's what we've been talking about with W.E.B. Du Bois. That's Killer Mike's argument on his Netflix special is the idea that if you do work hard, if you do have an idea, if you do play by the rules of capitalism, you could succeed. You can succeed. Capitalism cares about money. It doesn't care about social problems. It doesn't care about transgender people or gay people or black people or Asian people or Jewish people or Muslim people. Or It doesn't care about your racism. It cares about your money. And so capitalism allows more people who are usually locked out of wealth to gain access to it, to gain an education, to gain access to the good jobs. Now, that there are limits, and this is where we talk about systemic problems for women, for people of color, for my religious minorities, for social minorities, that it's harder to get in. But that's a social problem. Those are social rules. Capitalism doesn't care. Third, capitalism gives you hope. People think capitalism will work for them. If I work hard, I will make money. I will be successful. They don't think of it as if I make an investment and that investment goes down, I'll be destroyed. It's the optimism, the hope of the stock market. Put your money in the stock market, it will go up. And if everyone puts it in the stock market, it will go up. They don't think that if they don't pull their money out of the bank, the bank collapses, they lose their money. They don't see how they're going to be destroyed by capitalism. Remember, capitalism doesn't care. It cares about money. But it does give people hope. Tomorrow, I mean, look at, we're going to talk about it later, but... Um, Gone with the wind, Scarlett O'Hara. Tomorrow is another day. That's the idea of the Great Depression. It will get better. Finally, hierarchy. It does, even though it does give you more diversity and more entry, it does also reinforce your hierarchy. It tells you who's important and who's not. Now, who's important can be people of color or religious minorities or social minorities, but it's all based on money. Wealth determines who is better than others. The rich are better than the middle class, are better than the working class, which are better than the poor. And airline, an, an airplane is exactly built on this. It tells you exactly who is important. You have the rich at the front of the plane getting the best service, the biggest seats, the best food, the most comfortable flight. You have your middle class in the middle of the plane. They have more 
um, amenities, but they're still closer together. They're still kind of on top of each other, but they are on the plane able to go somewhere. They're going to France, right? The working class are in the back. They're crowded together. They've bought discount tickets, which they can't change. They can't bring on any extra um, baggage. They're pay- paying extra fees if they need to do anything. And yes, they're still going to France, the working class. They're in the back of the plane, right? They're in the cheapest seats. They're still going, which is good. But it's also probably the only vacation they're going to take, and it's the first time or the second time they've ever been to Europe. And then you have the poor, who aren't on the plane, who can't afford the ticket, who can't get the, the, the cab ride to the airport, who can't afford the luggage, who probably don't even have a passport, who will never leave the country. They usually don't even leave the city that they live in. They can't travel. They can't pay 200 bucks a night for a hotel room. Disney World works exactly the same way, right? The rich get the best hotels, the Grand Floridian, right? The middle class, they're not near the Magic Kingdom. They have to stay farther away. They get good hotels, um, the French Quarter. Uh, Coronado Springs, uh, Caribbean Beach, right? The working class have the $100, $150 place, and they are the all-star resorts. They are the uh, pop culture, pop century resorts. They're far away from the, from the parks. It's going to take them 45 minutes to an hour to get to the parks. And... They have the least amount of amenities. They're in a motel-style room, not in a hotel. Or the working class is also off campus. They're not actually on a Disney hotel. They have to drive in and pay extra. They're at a hotel off of Disney World. And then there's the poor who don't go at all, who have never gone to Disney World, who can't afford to go to Disney World, who can't pay the $150 a ticket, who can't pay the hundred plus dollars for the hotel room, who can't afford the five to seven days of food, who will never go. Wealth determines who is better than others, who gets access to the stuff. So why do people hate capitalism? Well, it privileges money over everything else, even government. It privileges money over everything else, over the economy, over the economy, over fairness, over people, over the environment. And people go, wait, these other things are important. That's Jesus. Jesus said it was easier for a camel to get through an eye of a needle than a rich man to get into heaven. Why? Why is it so hard for a rich man? Is it the money? No, it's not the money. It's not the money. Jesus says it's not the money because he takes out, he takes out the um, gold coin about paying taxes, and he says, "Give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Give unto God what is God." It's not the money that's the problem. It's the things people do. It's the capitalism. It's the things people do to make the money. That makes them sinful. The accumulation of the wealth is the problem. Now, you have to also remember, Jesus is living in a time when the only rich people are Romans, who are the conquerors of the of Judea, or people like Matthew, Levi, who are working with their collaborators with the Romans. So those are not nice people. But we see that in Les Mis, right? Jean Valjean does not know. He has made money. He has has owned a factory. He does not know that his foreman is sexually assaulting his female workers. And he doesn't 
care. He says to the foreman, take care of this problem. I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to hear about it. And the foreman's like, sure, I'll take care of it. And when Jean Valjean leaves, he goes to Fantine and says, sleep with me or get the F out. And she says, I won't sleep with you. So she leaves. So she's fired. It's exploitive. There's exploitive inequality. In capitalism, that's a feature, not a bug. Some, lots of people have to be poor so that few people can be rich. That's the way it works. And you could have a problem with that because most of you are poor. Most of you are in the bottom 95%. You have to work for somebody else. It wants that inequality. It wants capitalism demands that it requires poor people to exist because poor people have to work in order for the rich people who own the factories to make the money. If there are no poor people, then there are no workers. If there are no workers, then the factories don't make any money. Do you see how this works? We've seen this at the end of COVID where suddenly wages were going up because people didn't want to work in crappy jobs anymore. Nobody wanted to work a being in a chicken slaughterhouse. And so what has Arkansas done? Arkansas has made child labor legal again. It says, well, if adults don't want to work, we'll let children work. 14, 15, 16-year-olds work in these terrible jobs. Why? So they can make money. Well, why, do, why does a 16-year-old need to make money? Because they're poor, right? A rich 16-year-old is getting ready for college, is taking AP courses. It's only the poor 16-year-old who needs to work in a chicken slaughterhouse, making chicken nuggets. Capitalism is also anti-freedom. It profits from workers who cannot refuse to work. We've kind of just talked about this. But it profits from the enslaved or profits from the too poor, the extreme poor, who have to work because they can't negotiate better wages. And wages are the number one limit on profits. Remember, capitalism wants to make profits in order to reinvest. The higher the wages, the less profit. So they want workers who can't negotiate. That's children, that's women, that's um, undocumented workers, that's non-union labor, that's the poor or the enslaved who are forced by violence to work. All right, that brings us to part two, the Great Depression, where that entire system implodes. So you, I hope you can understand why there's a communist revolution, why there's socialism, why there's Marxist and, and romantic Arguments against capitalism in the 17 and the 1800s. Why the French Revolution happens. The idea of 1% of the population owning 90% of the land is unfair, is unequal. And so the French Revolution revolted against that system. That the idea that 1% of Americans own 50 or 60% of the wealth, that Elon Musk is worth $100 billion, and you are worth nothing. When you take your credit card bills and you take your rent and you minus um, your income, are you making any money? Are you have, do you have a profit at the end? Lots of people, something like half of all Americans are worth zero or worth less than zero because of their debts, whether it's their mortgage, 
whether it's their student loans, whether it's their credit card bills, that when you take it all together, more than half of Americans and a significant number of, quote, rich people are worth nothing. And I think that's the part that surprises people. There are people who make lots of money. I know plenty. And they're worth nothing. Why? Because they bought a house that's 700000 or a million dollars, $2 million, so that they can live in a good neighborhood. The house is an investment, but their kids can go to the good school, right? But they pay $30,000 in property taxes a year. They make two to three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand dollars a year, which you say, oh, that's a lot of money. Except that when you take the house, the car payments, their student loans from law school or medical school or graduate school, their student loans, right? Their kids' braces, their kids' um, uh, vac- uh, holidays and vacations or camp or sports, when you take all of their bills at the end, their percentage of income that's left over for savings is the same as, quote, poor people. They make a hell of a lot of money and they live in a very nice place, but they're living on credit. They're living in a place where if they lose their job or they get divorced, everything falls apart. It's a house of cards. It's not real money. Do you kind of see what I mean? So there's something like 45% of rich people are actually poor. They're not wealthy. Chris Rock had a thing. Um, because I'll get students who will say, well, what about basketball players or football players? They're, they're rich. They make millions of dollars. And I go, yes. Yes, they do. And people and my students will then say they can lose all that that money. Like there's rock stars who made millions of dollars and then they end up poor. And I go, yes, that is exactly true. And they were rich. Yes, they had lots of money. Yes, but that's not wealth. And Chris Rock had the best definition of this. Michael Jordan is rich. He said back in whatever it is, 2000. Michael Jordan is rich. The man who signs Michael Jordan's checks, he's wealthy. He will never run out of money. His kids will never run out of money. His great, great grandchildren will never have to work a day of their lives. That's wealth. Because it's in so many investments that are making so much money, you can't actually lose it. That's Brewster's Millions back in the 80s where Richard Pryor is given a a task. He can make $100 million, but he has to first spend $30 million and give it away. It's something something like that. And the problem is, is everything he tries to spend his money on for a rich person becomes an investment. So it's like, I'll buy five houses. I'll get rid of the money. And he can't because the five houses are now worth more money. Oh, he'll buy the Chicago Cubs. But buying the Chicago Cubs thus increased the wealth, the importance, the wealth of the Chicago Cubs. And thus it was worth more. So he can't, if he sells any of that stuff, he's making money on it. Do you see how this works? That's wealth. Rich is you just have a lot of money. So, So the football player is rich. His grandchildren will be wealthy. Does that make sense? Because by the time his children go through the money and invest it, and he's invested it, and he's lived off of it, and then his children live off of it, and they accumulate, and they put away, by the time it gets to the grandchildren, that rich that you you could spend and you could lose, by the grandchildren, now that's wealth. That's earning 10% in the stock market. That's earn, That's That's... That's a investment house that you use for Verbo and you rent out to poor people. And in the end, you, you're making money. You'll never lose it. 
the closest they ever came, that wealthy people ever came to really losing their money was the Great Depression. So capitalism died. Laissez-faire capitalism died. None of us, nobody lives in a capitalist system. We call it capitalist, but it's not because laissez-faire capitalism is no regulations or very, very, very few regulations. That's not our system. In fact, every time a Republican becomes president, President Trump did this and President George W. Bush did it too, they talk about how much regulations they're cutting, right? Famously, Donald Trump had a whole stack of papers. They were all, they were blank papers, but it didn't matter. It was there for the showmanship. That's fine. It was a stack of papers six feet tall. And it was like, this is all the regulations we've cut, right? Well, you can't, if we lived in capitalism, you wouldn't have those regulations. You wouldn't have the, 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 you wouldn't have COVID spending if we lived in capitalism. COVID would have just wiped out all the restaurants and you would have said, whoops, sucks to be them. You shouldn't have made a restaurant. Oops, sucks to be you. You should have had an online retail space. That's capitalism. That didn't happen. We had unemployment. We had PPP, which was a bailout for workers and for businesses. We had uh, cheap loans for businesses to reinvest in making online spaces. We had all kinds of ways. I, we all got money. The government just sent me a check. It sent me three checks, actually. So... We call it capitalism, but it's not capitalism. Just like when we talked about the Soviet Union, they called it communism, and it's not communism. Stalinism in no way, shape, or form looks like Marxist communism. It just doesn't. Our capitalism does not look anything like 1880 Gilded Age capitalism. It just doesn't. And it doesn't look like what Adam Smith is describing either other than private individuals still own businesses. But those businesses are heavily regulated. People's wages are heavily regulated. The banking sector you, you put your money into is heavily regulated. Why? Because a series of credit implosions in 1929 killed capitalism. Take a look at our two pictures if you're on the video. We have the stock market in 19... June of 1929, look how high it is. It's super huge. And June 1932, it is almost at zero. It is at the bottom of the graph. It is just one giant collapse. How did that happen? Well, in the 1920s, people had money from the war. They had worked during the war. They couldn't spend any money. They were saving that money. And so what they did was plop it into banks. They had nothing to spend on during the war. And then when the 20s happened, they spent. So consumerism goes up. That's good. It's exactly what happens after the Second World War. They spend money. And so rich people, the middle, you know, the upper middle class, Companies, and especially banks, load up on debt. They take the money they have, they invest it, those investments go up, they borrow to make their investments go up more, they buy stuff, they borrow money to buy some more stuff. Banks are making money, so they pour more money into the stock market, which is going up 400% in 10 years. That's unheard of. Unheard heard of. But most of that increase is kind of like a Ponzi scheme. It's it's a pyramid scheme. It's going it's going up because more and more people are pouring money in thinking it's going to continue to go up. And so they want to get in on it. And you make a lot of money if you borrow cheap and you pour a lot of money in. So if the stock market is going up, let's see, 40% a year, right? 10 years, 400%, that's 40% a year, right? But you borrow money at, say, 10%, okay? That means you'll make 30% a year. That's awesome. 
as long as the stock market goes up 30% a year, 40% a year. As long as it goes up 11% a year, you're still making money. But what happens if it doesn't go up? What happens if it goes down? Now you're losing the 10% on your loan, your interest on your loan, and now you're losing the principal. So if the stock market just stays even, you're losing 10%. But if it goes down... Now you're losing not only 10%, you can lose a massive amount of money. If it goes down, tw- uh, um, my investments in the last couple of years since COVID went up astonishingly in amount. And then the stock market has crashed 30%. So I've lost 30% of my wealth. Boom. Now it's all paper money. It's all in stocks. I wasn't living on it, so I'm doing okay. Thank you very much. But if I was taking loans out to to finance that because Google was going up 20% a year, 30% a year, now I'm in a lot of trouble because the bank comes to me and says, you owe this money. You owe $100,000. And I'm like, Uh, I don't have the money because I've lost it because the stock market has gone down. I now don't have the money to repay my loans. So what happened? Well, for me, it was inflation. It was inflation and interest rates went up. Boom. Okay. It was a credit implosion in 2007, 2008. What happened in 1929 was a series of bad events. Uh, famines, not famines, but droughts in the Midwest, bad crops in the Midwest, and then a London stock collapse because of fraud. There was, they were making so much money. It's kind of like 2007. They were making so much money that people lied. They cheated. They stole. They did a lot of fraud. So people were buying stocks that didn't even exist. People were investing in stuff. They were Taking people's money, Bernie Madoff, for example, taking people's money and using it for themselves, but telling people they were investing it, all kinds of stuff. So the London stock market collapsed in 1929. The Midwest collapsed, which means banks in the Midwest collapsed. So you have a banking problem. Farmers don't have the money to pay back their loans to the banks. The banks in the Midwest start to collapse, which means they they call in money on people who owe, owe them short-term loans that they use to invest in the stock market. London does the same thing. London banks do the same thing. So banks are losing that money. They call in those loans. People need to be, pay back those loans. So they go and start to sell their stock. Well, if everybody does this at the same time, you get a sell-off. You get a bank run. You get a mass sell-off. So you get a crash. And you could see it. it look at it. That top of the needle goes straight down. You do not want to be on that roller coaster. It goes straight down. And it recovers, 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 and then collapses. And it has this jagged up, down, up, down, up, down, but it's constantly going down. 25% of the value of the New York Stock Exchange was gone in two days, in October of 1929. It lost 50% of its value in three weeks. 90% of its value in four years. The stock market didn't recover to 1929's highest value until 1954, 25 years later, a generation later. This is the closest rich people came, wealthy people came to actually losing all of their money because they lost 90% of their, their, their investments. Even wealthy people are wiped out when they lose 90%. 9,000 banks were wiped out. Most most rural banks were wiped out. So if you're a rural farmer, you might have one or two banks in town. They're gone. Where do you go? You have to buy seed. You have to get a tractor. You have to buy animals. You have to buy feed for that animals. And you only make money once or twice a year when you do your harvests. So uh, most farmers, even today, most farmers live in debt because there's, it's a feast and famine kind of job. You pay a lot of money during the year to be able to pay it off back 
when you get a big crop, boom, you get a big paycheck when you sell your stuff off. But now, where do you go? Most of your rural banks are now wiped out. The U.S. gross domestic product, meaning the amount of money the country makes when you take everything together, dropped by $50 billion. That was 50% of America's value. 2008, the Great Recession, U.S. gross domestic product dropped by 2%. And the world collapsed. U.S. GDP dropped by 50% from 1929 to 1932. Okay. Okay. So we have a credit collapse, right? Banks are calling in loans. People can't pay those loans. The banks are going out of business. Which means people who had money in the banks are losing that money which means they have to take people in other banks start taking out that money. Remember, none of this is insured because it's laissez-faire capitalism. The bank is an investment. So they take the money out to stuff it under their mattresses, to stuff it into um, um, tomato sauce cans, you know, and bury it in the backyard. Literally, I had ants who did this. They took their money out of the banks took all this, all the money, wrapped it up, put a rubber band around it, and then put it in Italian sauce jars. And then took the Italian sauce jar and either stuffed, put it underneath their bed, put it in a, clo- in a hole in the closet, or literally dug holes in their backyard and put it in there. Because the idea was at least they won't lose it. They won't make any money on it, but at least they won't lose it. They'll still have it. Because if the bank goes out, you have nothing. You have nothing. Because there was no insurance on the banks. Now, that's terrible because now the bank can't loan out money. And so how does the credit collapse become the Great Depression? Because of conservative economics and a conservative social philosophy. We're going to see this in the United States. We're going to see this in France. We're going to see this in the U.K., The idea was what was called at the time rugged individualism. We can call it the Protestant work ethic. It's the idea that real men feed themselves. That you work hard, you make money, you will succeed. If you're not making money, it's because you're lazy. If you're poor, it's your fault. Go get another job. That was the philosophy. That was Hoover's philosophy. That was Republican philosophy. That was conservative philosophy. Go get another job. You're poor because of you. Now, the Great Depression had a problem. There were no jobs. Everything was collapsing. Because without the the banks to give loans to businesses, the businesses had to lay off people. If they laid off people, those people could not pay back their loans to the banks, much less buy other stuff. If no one's buying stuff or paying back loans to banks, more banks go under and more factories have to close because no one's buying their stuff, which means more workers are put on unemployment or are now unemployed who can't pay back their loans, who can't pay their mortgages, who can't You see how this works? It becomes a cycle. It's a depression cycle. So rugged individualism said, just go get another job. Well, there weren't other jobs. There just weren't any. So you end up with this collapse of a tax base. We saw this in 2008. We've seen this before. And you hear the same thing. And it's a conservative response. Less money in taxes means we have to spend less. We have to tighten our belts. The American government should act like a family. When families have less money, they spend less. Government has to, quote, live within its means. You, you hear this every time the, the economy goes down. Less government spending. But what that means is, it makes sense. It does. And that's why it's conservative. It makes sense. There's less money. You should spend less money. Debt is bad. 
In fact, debt is what caused this whole problem, right? But if there's no money in the system, capitalism stops working. Capitalism freezes. If there's nobody spending money, if there's no credit, if there's no purchasing, if there's no investment, capitalism dies. And that's what happened between 1929 and 1932. It just collapsed because there was nobody buying stuff. There was no one with any money. Everybody's unemployed. Now, when I say everybody, I don't mean literally every person. But in Germany, it's 40%. In the United States, it's 25%. In the UK, it's 20% unemployment. Okay, now remember, most women don't work. Children can't work. So most of your people are not working. And now you're wiping out another 25% of men. 40% of men in Germany. It's higher for, in the United States, it's higher for black men. Something like 50% of all black men don't have a job. So they can't spend any money. If you're a landlord, you're not collecting any money. And there's no place to go. That's the biggest thing. There are no other jobs. So capitalism died. And here's the bread lines versus the picket lines. Here's the free food for the unemployed, the big long lines, the people on welfare. Now rugged individualism would tell you, you're all lazy. You're terrible people. That's why it's called the depression. The dep depression is not an economic term. It's a philosophical term. It's a psychological term. It's not an economic one. But the idea of the depression is everybody felt that everybody was affected. Nobody had jobs. 80% of rural workers were probably unemployed. 80% of rural workers. So yes, it's 25% of workers total on average. But in some places, it's way more than others. So capitalism effectively died. There is no purchasing. There is no investment. There is no engine. The engine ran out of gas. The engine has seized. So what becomes a symbol of the Great Depression? The unemployed man and the Hooverville. There were no jobs. Like we said, 25% unemployment in the USA. But in, the, in farm workers, it was 80%. In the UK, it's 20% unemployment. In Germany, it's 40% unemployment. Since these are mostly men, it's a crisis of masculinity. For African-American men, it's 50%. In Atlanta, it was 70% unemployment for black men. Black wealth was wiped out with black banks. Remember what we talked about with, with Marcus Garvey and W.E.B. Uh, du Bois. The idea of, of creating black wealth separate from white wealth so that black folk could have their own economy separate from racism. That's wiped out. It's gone because the banks went out. Now you get homelessness. People can't pay their rent. They can't pay their mortgages. And capitalism says, if you can't pay, we will replace you with someone who can. So you get entire towns of homeless people on the move. Those are the Hoovervilles. And they're named Hoovervilles because of what was deemed the lack of help from the president. They were a Hooverville because Hoover created these by not helping people. Now, here's your rugged individualism if you take a look. I know three languages. Here's the man, very famous. It's, it's, in, it's a British uh, placard. I know three trades. I know three languages. I fought for three years. I have three children. I've had no work for three months, but I only want one job. And he's, this is his resume, searching for a job. That's rugged individualism, just get a job. But there are no jobs. The Hooverville in um, Washington, D.C. was attacked and burned to the ground by General MacArthur and General Patton two guys who will become very famous in the Second World War. There were 15,000 people. That's the size of Collingswood. 
15,000 people were burned. They didn't, weren't murdered, but they were kicked out. That's our, our photo of the Hooverville on fire with the Washington Monument beyond it. Women went into low-paid service shops because men were so wiped out. Women, their wives, their daughters had to go to work. So female work increased by 25%, which sounds good, but it was 25% from almost nothing. Less than 30% of married women worked in 1930. And then there's the backlash because the idea is if women are working, that means a man doesn't have that job. So 25 states created work bans on married women by 1940. So single women stayed single so they could keep working. Black and Hispanic domestic servants are completely wiped out. The number one job for black and Hispanic women was a domestic servant. Well, they're wiped out because middle class and rich folk who, who used to employ domestic servants as a sign of their wealth had to fire them, had to let them go. They don't have the money. So there are no domestic servants anymore. So black and Hispanic women are wiped out. So that means black wealth is wiped out. So even in black communities, men aren't working. 50% of all African-American men are, are unemployed. But it also means almost all black women are unemployed too. So there is no black wealth anymore. It's just wiped out. So that brings us to part three of this class, which is how do we how did they save capitalism? And what was popular culture like during this time? How did it change? So to save capitalism, Roosevelt had to kill it. And he killed it with objections from both the left, from the communists, and from the right, from the conservatives. Because what he introduced was what we would call socialism. It's called Keynesian economics. It's in Scandinavia called managed capitalism. It's the idea that it's still private ownership of the property. Thus, capitalism. But the government will spend massive amounts of money in a depression to keep people working. Government must intervene with regulations on everything from wages to hours, to how you, what you can sell, where, how much, for what price, and will especially regulate the banks, what the banks can invest in, what they can't invest in. Rich people are going to have to pay much higher taxes to help everybody else. We see taxes on rich folk, meaning the top 5%, go up something like triple, go up from like 25% to 60% of their income. By World War II, it's 90%. So Keynesian economics is, now Keynes is a economist. He's British. He was also gay. Um, he would later marry a woman. So I guess we would call him bi, but in the, in the 20s, he was, he was a gay. So he was a guy that most people didn't take seriously. He was very flamboyant, very smart. And he had this idea that government is the only thing with money. Government can always have money. Governments don't go bankrupt because governments can print money or they can tax money or governments can borrow money from itself with bonds. So governments don't run out of money. And his idea was, in a depression, you buy stuff. You employ as many people as possible. You go into debt. You do the opposite of conservative orthodoxy, conservative economics. You don't tighten your belt. You spend more money than you've ever thought you could make. Because the idea is to keep people employed. <coughs> Keynesian economics is why you got three checks from the government during COVID, each for $1,600. It's why businesses got hundreds of billions of dollars in bailouts. In PPP loans, it's why the aircraft airlines got $50 billion just to keep flying. To keep their, their 
their workers employed to keep their mechanics, their pilots, even though they were flying. And I had f- friends who were who are journalists, who are uh, lawyers, who are doctors, who are who are nurses, who were going places, and they said they flew on a plane with six people on it. Well, that plane shouldn't be flying under capitalism. It's losing lots of money. There's no way those six people, no matter what they spent, paid for the gas, much less the people, the pilots, the uh, attendants. How are they running? Because the government gave American Airlines billions of dollars and said, just stay running. Keep your people employed. So that they keep spending. So what is the new deal? And this is where we get the first 100 days now. The new deal was 15 major bills in 100 days. It was a trillion dollars in spending. You get massive spending on infrastructure. In New, in New Jersey and Philly, we get the PACO. Haddon Avenue gets paved. Philly City Hall, Philadelphia City Hall, famously, Philadelphia City Hall gets rebuilt. You spend on culture, the Walt Whitman House in Camden. You end prohibition on, on alcohol so that you can tax it. You have social welf- welfare protections. The FDIC means if you put your money, take your money out of the backyard, take your money from the mattress, put it into the bank, and the government will insure it so that if the, if the bank goes under, you still get paid because the bank needs the deposits to loan out to the businesses to keep the economy going. If there's no deposits, the bank goes out of business, which means businesses can't get any loans to to grow, to hire new people, so they slowly collapse and then go out of business. So the idea was of the FDIC is we will protect your money if you invest it in a bank. Now, It had a limit, and what we just saw with the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank is the idea that there might never be a limit. There might be no limits on how much you can lose because you have major companies in Silicon Valley Bank that had hundreds of millions of dollars well beyond the limit of the insurance that the government came out and said, we will protect that. Why? Because we don't want Roku to go out of business and put 10,000 workers out out of business. So thus, insurance, mortgage securities. So if you lose your house, you you lose your job, you won't lose your house. Stock market regulations to limit how much you can buy or sell in a day. Minimum wages so that you don't have this race to the bottom of people competing just to have a job, working for a, a dollar an hour. You have social security Social security is meant for people to retire. We don't want 70, 80, 90 year old people working. Why? Because a young person could have that job. We get welfare. Welfare, we can call welfare a bunch of different things, but it's essentially child protection, child poverty protection. It's a way of keeping children out of poverty. That's what it was meant. Welfare under the New Deal was protection for children. Because, and this is this is what um, Senator Patrick Moynihan will will re kind of discover in the '60s, is that poor people, poor children become poor people, and so if you keep people out of poverty as children, they're less likely to be poor people as adults. So it's a cheap investment. It's why. Um, elementary school is free. Why high school is free? Why today community college really should be free? It should become it should have become free about 20, 25 years ago when jobs began demanding middle class jobs began demanding an associate's degree higher to get a job. And so, just like high school was free by the nineteen fifties, community college really should have been free by the early nineteen nineties. Um, was this popular? Was, was government intervention in the economy popular? Heck yeah, it was. 
because one, it worked. People felt better. And you will have conservatives today on Twitter debate, oh, the New Deal didn't end the Depression. Oh, yeah? Ask the people who voted for the New Deal. In 1932, Roosevelt won the biggest election up to that point. And then in 1936, four years into the New Deal, he won an even bigger election, the biggest landslide in electoral history. Um, he won 60% of the popular vote. That will be bested by Lyndon Johnson. Now, Nixon will come close in 72 in both, in both popular vote and um, electoral count. He'll win a massive amount. And then Reagan will do the same in 1984. So I'm not going to say it's, it's not a democratic thing. But in 1930s, it was a liberal thing. They wanted Keynesian economics. They wanted an intervention in the economy. It was massively popular. So it completely changed how the USA did capitalism. These two victories that are such landslides completely changed how the USA did capitalism. Black people became Democrats. Now remember, Democrats were the party of slavery. They were the party of the South. They are the party of Jim Crow. Why would they become, why would black folk become Democrats? Because of Roosevelt. Because of the New Deal. They be, the Democrats become the party of union-working white men which today may seem crazy to you because that's the Republican Party. But from the 1930s to 1994, this alliance of black folk, union working white men, rural workers, was massively popular. So the Democrats controlled the House of Representatives for 60 years, from 1932 to 1994. They win the presidency in 2008. They won it again in 2020 in these depressions, in these recessions. That shows that people still trust Democrats more to help people. That when things are really crappy, they still vote Democrat. The exception to that may be 1980 with the end where Jimmy Carter as the Democrat lost to Republican um, Ronald Reagan who promised more conservatism. But the thing about that is 1980 is a weird time because of the cultural revolution that happened in the 60s, the economic crisis of the 70s. And so we'll talk about this as we go it's kind of the argument that Keynesian economics, that liberalism in both society, civil rights, sexual rights, feminism, um, and Keynesian economics had gone too far. That the country wanted to be more conservative. They wanted a back, they, it was a backlash election. But, you know, credit where it's due, that would be the exception to this period from 1932 to 1994. What about the black experience in the Great Depression? Well, we see this photographed by Gordon Parks, who's an African-American photographer who was paid, like several photographers, like many photographers, by the government to do the American experience. And so being an African-American, he went to record the African-American experience. And what he was trying to do was show the dignity of work, of equality, and the psychological trauma of racism. We see this in his American Gothic photo of the, of the um, woman custodian with the mop and the broom and the American flag, the um, deli owner with the watermelon. We see the racism with the small black child who is, this was a psychological test, um, that government-funded psychologists were trying to find out um, to basically CRT, right, critical race theory, what was the effect of racism. And they would take a, a black child and they'd hold two dolls. One was a white doll, one was a black doll. And he'd say, who's the good baby? 
And these black kids would pick the white baby. And the idea was that what racism was doing was teaching young black kids that they were worthless, that they weren't good. So what this was doing, what Gordon Parks and other photographers were doing was telling America about itself. And the New Deal programs, whether it was the minimum wage, whether it was Social Security, which most black folk didn't have access to, but would in the future. What these um, regulations did was show that government can help black folk. And this is the first time since the 1860s. After the 1870s, after the end of Reconstruction and the coming of Jim Crow and racial segregation, the idea was government will hurt black folk, that government will be on the side of racism. And what the New Deal did, what Roosevelt did, was say government can help black folk. And that will be true from Roosevelt through Kennedy, through Lyndon Johnson and the Civil Rights and the Voting Rights Act. And it's, you know, in some ways kind of true today, though through the 80s into the 90s, we have massive changes in government intervention in the economy especially to help individual folk. But there's still this idea that government can help people. And that's why Barack Obama, a Democrat, a black man with a funny name, can win such a major election in 2008 where even racists were voting for him. They figured in when times are good, They want Republicans because Republicans are pro-growing the economy, less regulation, more money, less taxes, right? But when the economy hits the fan, since the 1930s, people vote Democrat. They vote liberal because the liberals say, we will give you money. We will help you. Interestingly, President Trump did a very liberal economics during COVID. He gave money. He spent money. He he made an argument that you should vote for him. He'll get you more money. So, what about popular culture in the Great Depression? How How did American art and culture reflect the Great Depression? Well, we have three things. We have American regionalism. American regionalism is a kind of art. We see it a lot in painting. And the idea of this was to show dignity of people in the Depression. So it wasn't modern art in the kind of geometric, cubist kind of way. It's still realism. But it's emotional. It's trying to show with American Gothic or Nighthawks, this dignity of people who are working, who are trying to get through the Depression. But there's also this melancholy that something is lost. It's not optimistic. You take a look at American Gothic, you take a look at Nighthawks, look at Nighthawks. There's four people in this diner. It's obviously at night. The diner is the only place open There's only four people in it, though there's lots of seats. And those four people are not looking at each other and they're not conversing with each other. There's no lights on in any of the other businesses on the first floor. There's no lights on in any of the other apartments on the second floor. There's nobody in this city. It's dead. There's no economics being done. So there's this melancholy. In American Gothic, you can see it in the faces. This is a farmer and his daughter. They have a nice house behind them. He's got the pitchfork. He's got his overalls on. They have dignity. But they also have melancholy. Something has been lost. And that's the big thing about the Depression, why it's a depression. 
that thing that was lost was not easy to explain. That it was it was the the optimism of capitalism. It was the optimism of America. It was nobody knew when it would get better. Nobody knew if it would get better. There was just the twenties were over. The enthusiasm of the twenties was over. The fun of the twenties was over. But it wasn't replaced by a somber or sober kind of conservatism that rural Protestants would have liked. The kind of people who wanted um, Christmas Hallmark movies, the people who wanted more people in church, the people who wanted prohibition, who wanted people to get married and have kids and live the way people used to live back in the day. They don't have that either. That didn't work. People don't go to that because there's no money for it. So there's a melancholy. Conservatism lost. Capitalism was dead. And nobody knew what to replace it with. And so this art is trying to learn something about America. It's trying to figure out. American regionalism is about learning about America. We see it a lot in the photography, like Gordon Parks. It's the dignity of the, of the miners in West Virginia covered in soot. The fishermen out in California and Washington with their broken hands. Um, it's not the Great Depression, but it's, it's um, Nor'easter Alexa, the song by Billy Joel. It's that kind of song. The Nor'easter Alexa song from the 1980s is about fishermen of Long Island who are running out of money because the fisheries have all been destroyed. They've been overfished. There's no fish anymore. And they own, they have, their kids need to go to school. Their kids need clothes. The boat has to be repaired. They need money. They owe, owe the bank. They have to gas up the boat. They have to pay their workers and there's no money. And so there's this song that is, it's about the dignity of work. I highly recommend listening to it. It's about the dignity of work, about how hard these people work. They're good people doing a good job, but they can't make money doing it. And who are these people? Long Island fishermen, thus American regionalism. What about escapism? We see American escapism, especially in movies. The Wizard of Oz goes literally from black and white in Kansas, from the Depression in Kansas, from sepia tones in Kansas of the Depression, to she opens up the door, and in Oz, it is technicolor. It is a whole new world of vibrant colors. The Emerald City isn't in black and white. It's in green, bright bright green. The yellow brick road is bright, bright yellow. And so American escapism has themes of prosperity, gone with the wind, the pre-Civil War South with its problems of race and slavery, but also recovery again, Wizard of Oz, gone with the wind, the idea that you can be poor, but you can start over. You can do something with your life. Dorothy can get home. She can go on a great adventure. Scarlett O'Hara can lose Tara and then rebuild it, then lose it again, and then rebuild it again. There is themes of honesty, young Mr. Lincoln. And honesty is so important because so much that was lost was trust. The bank said, we're fine. Everything is great. And then they imploded. The Wall Street said, everything's great. Give us money and imploded. The government, Hoover, said, we're going to take care of you. Just go get a job. And there were no jobs and they couldn't take care of people. So there's bright colors, which was rare in movies. There's expensive epics. The amount of money that's that's spent on Gone with the Wind is massive in the depression but the idea of these movies and why they were so popular why they were made so much money 
was because it allowed you to get away from the depression for a few hours. It allowed you to escape from your life. There's also the crime and gangster movies and the comic book heroes. James Cagney. James Cagney goes from being a song and dance man during the, second, during the First World War. He, he does over there, over there, over there. The Yanks are coming. The Yanks are coming. And we won't stop fighting till it's done. Over there, over there, right? He's singing and dancing. He's doing musicals. And what does he become? He becomes the most famous gangster of the, of the 20s, of the 30s. He, he's Scarface. And he fights the system. And fighting the system is fun. You get Bonnie and Clyde. You get Billy the Kid. The idea is that you fight the system. You bank rob. You steal. You kill. But the system always wins, though. James Cagney always dies. He never gets away with it. Because American morality wouldn't allow bad guys to win. They could fight the system. And it was fun. It's like Skinner in The Simpsons going to Lisa Simpson. What are you rebelling against? And she goes, what have you got? That it's fun to break the rules. But in a democracy, if everyone breaks the rules, the society will collapse. And so the movie's always pulled back at the end. James Cagney will be defeated by the G-men, by the FBI, who are honest and good they're not the corrupt local police or the idiot uh, state police. They're the honest police. So the system always wins. We see this in Superman and Batman, the comic book heroes. Superman is a super Jew. He's invented by two Jewish men. He's an immigrant fighting against fascism fighting for peace, justice, and the American way, for democracy. He has fascist powers. He is a fascist Superman who doesn't act like a fascist. There's a famous quote from one of the stories by Batman, who is, you know, Superman is like a god, and it's good for us he doesn't realize that he could act like a god. And Superman never thinks about it. He uses his power for peace for justice, to defeat fascism, to help democracy, to not be in charge. Superman would very much like, if you ever watched the second movie, Superman 2, which I saw as a kid, he wants to be a regular American. He doesn't want to be Superman anymore. He'd very much like crime and war and fascism to go away. To not have to save people. It's exhausting. But he's an immigrant. Remember, he comes from, a, he's a refugee seeking asylum in America, in middle of America, in Kansas. Fighting for peace, justice in the American way. He becomes American. He's the immigrant who has made good. He has come to America seeking a refuge, seeking asylum. And what does he do? He becomes the most American American. He grows up in the Midwest. He goes to the big city. He becomes a journalist. Well, what about Batman? Well, Batman is kind of the opposite. Batman is an American. He's a rich American. His parents were rich. He's a philanthropist. He shows that capitalism can save people. Batman has no skills. He has no special talent. He is not Superman. But what does he have? He has money and he has time. So he can make the inventions. Iron Man is kind of the Marvel version of Batman. The rich guy who does good. Iron Man, Tony Stark is not Captain America. Captain America is Marvel Superman. Right? Peace, justice, the American way. Captain America fights for democracy. Tony Stark doesn't fight for democracy. Tony Stark fights for capitalism. But the idea is that through Batman, the rich guy can help you. He's not the enemy anymore. 
Remember, in the Depression, the rich guy is the enemy. But Batman says, no, 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 no. The rich man can be the good guy. And so we get these three different kinds of heroes. The anti-hero, James Cagney, who says fighting against the system is fun, but you can't do it forever. At some point, you have to come back. You have to, you have to follow the rules at some point. Superman, that Jewish immigrants, that immigrants in general can help America, can become American. They're not the problem. They're actually the solution. And Batman, rich people can be the solution to our problems too. And so we see in American culture, American popular culture, lots of different ways of dealing with the depression. Unlike communism and unlike fascism, which had primarily one major way of dealing with the problems, one major cultural solution, the solution Stalin liked for communism, the solution Hitler and the Nazis liked for fascism. Here, democracy has multiple ways, which would make sense, right? So that brings us to the end. I hope you're okay. We did, instead of three separate lectures, we did one larger lecture. Um, we got in a little under an hour and a half. So thank you. Be safe. Take care.